The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go now to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. But that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. We are still in the first chapter of Mark, and a lot is going on here. Everything is going in fast pace. Jesus has been baptized, a powerful launch of his public ministry. People have witnessed nothing like this before. The heavens open, God saying that he is God's beloved son. And the spirit then just took him to wilderness for 40 days, preparing himself to whatever it takes. For 40 days, he prepared himself. Jesus becoming strong and mighty, he comes from the wilderness to seashore, and he chooses his disciples. Hard-working fishermen, relentlessly fishing all night, not giving up to provide for their families. And Jesus chooses them by giving them a sign. As we also see last week that Jesus spoke scriptures with authority, his level of preparedness is not one dimensional. His body, mind and spirit aligned to accomplish, to do the mission that he was here for, to proclaim the kingdom of God. He is on a mission. It seems in the year 2024, the Lord came to Noah, who was now living in the United States, and said, Once again, the earth has become wicked and overpopulated, and I see the end of all flesh before me. Build another ark and save two of every living thing along with the good humans. He gave Noah the blueprint saying, you have six months to build the ark before I will start the unending rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Six months later, the Lord looked down and saw Noah weeping in his yard, but no ark. Noah, he roared, I am about to start the rain. Where is the ark? Forgive me, Lord, begged Noah, but things have changed. I needed a building permit. I've been arguing with the inspector about the need for a sprinkler system. My neighbors claim that I have violated the neighborhood zoning laws by building the ark in my yard and exceeding the height limitations. When I started gathering the animals, the animals rights group sued me. They insisted that I was confining wild animals against their will, and so on and so forth. And he names several other practical concerns that are being obstacles to build an ark. And suddenly the sky is cleared, the sun began to shine, and the rain was stretched across the sky. 
Nova looks up and wonder and asks, You mean you are not going to destroy the world? God says, No, says the, the government, beat me to it. Now I need to think of saving the earth, which God implements in Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God wanted to fix it once and for all. No more rain, no more rain for 40 days and 40 nights to destroy the earth. And Jesus is here on a mission to save the world, to proclaim the kingdom of God. While God's intervention we see in the life of Jesus, Jesus is not a magic. He did not speak scriptures with authority in the synagogue because Holy Spirit secretly helped him to win over the scribes, but because he learned and grounded in the scriptures from the very beginning. He built his foundation as strong as it can be. He knew what he was doing. No matter what comes in his way to shake his ground, he was still firm, grounded, and learned. He was prepared. We see in the text today that he went away, withdrew himself to wilderness. When he began his ministry and spoke scriptures with authority, when they witnessed the unclean spirits trembling before him, the people were perplexed. Those people in the Capernaum, they came to Jesus. They were at his door. One of Jesus' intentional ministries of his care for people is shown in healing people from their ailments, their sufferings. Jesus did not take their individual sufferings easy. God does not want us to be ill. God wants us to be well. It is interesting about the healing of Simon's mother-in-law that Mark gives us some details. More interesting to me is that Mark's testimony to what happened next. When Jesus lifted her, touched her, and healed her, then the fever left her, and then she began to serve them. While it may not go well in today's world, I am sure she was happy to serve them. She feels purposeful and whole after a fever has left her. She feels blessed to serve the guests, not necessarily out of expectation, but feeling the abundance of blessing that the fever has left her, that she is free from Fever and suffering, we do not know how long, what extent of aches and pains, they sure didn't have Tylenol back then. One of the critical ministries of Jesus on earth is healing ministry and make, making people well and whole. Call it sickness, demons, unclean spirits. Back then, in the Mediterranean culture, in the shame and honor society, it was everyone is expected to behave in a certain way, very specific certain way. There were norms. It wasn't a free world. The modern world may have driven out the unclean spirits of one kind. We sure have created and welcomed many other demons and allowed them to grow up, become giants, making the society to be ill. And today we see that God doesn't want us to be ill, whether as individuals or as society. But God wants us to be well. What must we do to be well as a church, a body of Christ? What are our social ailments? We see that this first miracle of healing is not just a random act, but an intentional one. Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. As he moves on in the text, 
even though it's a short text, it gives us so many details. You will see, you will notice that Mark is carefully mentioning the changes of the time. With the arrival of evening at sunset, the Sabbath concludes. And then it says, in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place, and there he prayed. He needed to go away from the influx of people coming to him for healing, and he healed many, but then he withdrew himself. He had to have that quiet time to be one with himself and God. He didn't even tell his disciples where he was going. He didn't even want them around. And the same need is there for everyone. To withdraw and step back is necessary spiritual practice for us as individuals, for us as the body of Christ. It is hard to withdraw in the fast-paced world that we are in. We feel like we are missing the action if we withdrew. The text says that he spent his time in prayer. What is prayer for us? Most of us connect with prayer, the prayers as intercessions. Intercessions, the prayer's time that we do, is only one aspect of prayer. In the worship, we begin with the prayer of confession. We also do prayers of thanksgiving. In the songs we praise, all of those are the aspects of prayers. Not only the giving petitions to God. Prayer is the time that one spends with God. It is not only the time that we say things to God, but it is also the time to listen to the voice of God. It is the time to connect with God. Prayer had very important place in the life of Jesus. Important to withdraw, to be present with yourself, to soul search, to respond with act of love in prayer for ourselves and for others. A lot of times, prayer is the last resort after people have tried everything else. When we connect with others, we do pray for them as an act of service. We pray for the world as an act of love. And those are intercessory prayers that we do together as church or in our own personal lives. It seems there was this journalist who was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau of Newspaper. He gets an apartment overlooking the Wailing Wall. After several weeks, he realizes that whenever he looks at the wall, he sees an elderly Jewish man praying vigorously. The journalist wondered whether there was a publishable story here. He goes down to the wall, introduces himself and says, I've been seeing you come here every day to the wall. What are you praying for? The elderly man replies, what am I praying for? In the morning, I pray for world peace. How long have you been coming to the wall to pray? The elderly man becomes reflective and says, how long? Maybe 20, 25 years. Amazed journalist finally says, so how does it feel to come and pray every day for 20 years? Jesus encourages everyone to pray with passion and persistence. Urges us not to give up, not to stop praying. Because it is a sign of our relationship with God. It is a sign of our relationship with one another. You can't pray and hate. The only way you can do is to love. And that is where you nurture your love for yourself, for God, and for one another. May God bless these words. Amen.